In this video, we're going to be exploring my favorite homemade tool, my continuity tester. I made this as an answer to the insanity that modern commercially available tools have become. When I look at a tool, I always ask myself, what is the fundamental requirement of this tool? And a good tool does that thing really well with no mess, no muss, no distraction. It just does one thing really well. And I think tools should really be like that. Not overcomplicated with menus and features and all things that are driven not by people who use tools, but by people who sell tools. And that's a big difference. Now, I grew up with tools like this. I got this thing from my grandfather. It's really simple. It's made out of really high quality materials and it does its job beautifully. It makes me happy whenever I use it. In fact, it even inspires me. It makes me want to be more precise and improve my skill and become better at making things. And that's a beautiful thing as opposed to so much of the crap that you get these days that when you use a crap tool, it just makes you want to stop and cry and do something else because it doesn't give you that feeling. So when I set about to design this continuity tester, I had the same feeling in mind. I wanted to make something that really would last a lifetime and would always make me happy when I use it. So what's the big deal here anyway? All we want to do is unambiguously check that two points on some board or cable or something that we're working on are actually physically connected together. 99% of people probably just reach for their digital voltmeter and fiddle with the knobs and switches for a while and go to town. But my fluke meter, for example, thinks 50 ohms is continuity, and that's just not going to cut it. Now, I'm sure the designers of this product made this compromise for a lot of complicated reasons, but for what I'm doing, it's just not workable. So I go shopping on the internet for a solution to this problem, but I just can't find anything that seems to make sense. There's a lot of little niche products that serve specific markets, but nobody ever lists the exact technical features in a way that makes any sense. It's all just vague marketing speak. So what are the features of the ultimate continuity tester? Let's try to write this down and make a comprehensive specification for this thing. Number one, it's got to be bone simple. I don't want to be distracted by anything other than the project that I'm working on. It's got to be always on and ready. I got zero patience for power switches and mode selectors when all I want to do is get a continuity reading. The battery's got to last at least a year. I grow very weary of constant battery changing. It's got to validate real continuity, and that means less than 5 ohms. I have no idea why people think that 50 ohms is continuity. It should indicate general current flow, so even if it's not official continuity, I can still tell there's some current flowing. It needs to test LEDs and diodes without too much trouble. It should never blow anything that I'm testing up. That means its maximum current should be less than 20 milliamps. It should be really mechanically robust so I can knock it around without worrying about breaking it. And probably most difficult of all, it has to be electrically indestructible. I need to be able to stupidly poke this thing on 230 volts mains voltage and know that it's not going to get blown up. That's the only way this thing will last a lifetime. Let's start our design exercise with the simplest possible circuit. Just a battery, a resistor, and an LED. The resistor limits the peak current to about 10 milliamps, which is perfect for the LED. I think I built my first one of these when I was about eight years old and it served its purpose admirably. The main flaw in this design is really that it has no threshold. Any reasonable resistance across the probes will make the LED begin to light up. So it's not really good for circuits where you have other possible current paths that aren't necessarily a connection. The next level of improvement would be to add some kind of threshold circuit and a beeper. So it takes a certain minimum resistance to make the beeper beep. In this case we use a simple PNP transistor and two resistors to create a threshold circuit. 
With this setup, the beeper won't make any noise until about 8 milliamps are flowing, which corresponds to about 60 ohms across the probe tips. Not bad, but still far from 5 ohms that we're looking for. If we do the math and say that we have 10 milliamps of current flowing and we want to resolve less than 5 ohms, that means we're, we have to be able to identify a voltage drop of less than 50 millivolts. A single transistor is going to be really hard pressed to deliver that kind of accuracy at that low of a voltage. Now we really need to add an op amp or comparator to do the dirty work. We use an MCP6022 op amp as a comparator in this circuit. We turn the power on to this op amp using a simple transistor switch that turns on long before 5 ohms would ever be detected. This makes sure that when the circuit is off, almost zero power is consumed from the battery. When current starts flowing in the test leads, Q1 turns on and powers the comparator and also illuminates the red LED. The voltage divider formed by R7 and R9 puts about 50 millivolts on the non-inverting input of the op amp. This sets the trigger threshold for detecting below 5 ohms on the input. R10 provides positive feedback. This makes the circuit cleanly switch back and forth between the on and off state without oscillation. R8 and Q3 form a switch which controls the piezo beeper. Now it's time to add some refinements to the circuit. The transistor Q2 combined with R3, R4, and R6 give the switch a bit of positive feedback to make sure that it switches cleanly on rather than sitting in an indeterminate state. Since the input impedance of the MCP6022 is so high and draws a vanishingly small amount of current, we can easily isolate it from the input just using a bunch of high value resistors. R8, 9, and 10 provide a large degree of isolation. The three additional diodes, D2, D3, and D4, are intended to protect the input from large excursions of voltage, like when we accidentally plug this thing into 230 volts AC. Let's assume for a second that we're on the positive half cycle of this mains voltage. The peak voltage is going to be about 325 volts positive applied to the red positive input. Right off the bat, D2 here saves us from any current flowing through that branch. That's a 600 PIV diode and it blocks all current flow in that direction. The voltage at D3's anode is going to try to rise, but will be clamped to 3 volts by the path connecting it directly to the battery. This means that that node that goes into the input of the op amp can never go more than a diode drop above 3 volts, or about 3.6 volts. All totally fine. Because of this diode clamping action, resistors R8 and R9 see the brunt of this 325 volts. That's why we use two of them here in series, so their voltage rating is never exceeded. So now we got this 325 volts divided by about a mega ohm. So it's really about 325 microamps flowing in those resistors. They're not going to get very warm. You could sit here all day in this condition and nothing bad's going to happen. This pretty much solves the problem for any positive over voltage applied to the input of our tester. D4 will also clamp any negative excursion of voltage to a diode drop above ground. So this means that this little mechanism will work for both positive and negative voltage excursions. But there's still one really nasty problem that we have to solve. D2 protects us wonderfully from any positive voltage excursions, but does absolutely nothing for negative excursions. In that case, R1, R2, and Q1 all see the full 325 volts and will burst into flames in a horrible disaster that will leave us all crying. We've got to figure out a way to protect those parts. The diode does not work here because current is flowing in the normal direction that it needs to flow in when the circuit is working. So we're really in bad shape here. We can't just use big fat power resistors here because the amount of power is enormous. R1 alone would dissipate over 400 watts when you plug this thing into mains voltage. What we need is some kind of magic electronic circuit breaker that could just break the current path 
and protect this whole thing almost instantaneously and do so without becoming incredibly ridiculously complicated. Thankfully, there really is such a thing. Borns makes this part called a TBU, or Transient Blocking Unit for short. It's kind of like an electronic circuit breaker made out of two back-to-back -back depletion mode MOSFETs that act as a circuit breaker. When the current flowing through this normally low resistance device gets to a certain value, it snaps into a high impedance state and cuts the current. This happens in about a microsecond. These things are normally used for protecting data lines in like lightning environments and stuff like that. Perfect for protecting our continuity tester. By placing this thing in series with D2, we prevent the current from reaching any destructive level. Okay, so we talked really big about how awesome this protection thing is. Let's really try it. And yes, it totally works. Now I have faith that this thing will last forever. Now it's time for a quick teardown to have a look at what's inside this thing. As usual, it's a crazy mishmash of through hole and surface mount parts because that's basically what I got, so I use what I got. So I hope you found this little design exercise um, informative and interesting. I remember when I was starting out in electronics design, I'd look at a schematic for a commercial product and be absolutely horrified by all the components that were just like sprinkled all over the schematic that I didn't understand. The basic function is clear, but what are all these extra parts for? And then little by little you start to see, especially when you look at an exercise like this, there's always these little problems that crop up in the real world, like how to protect things, how to reduce radio emissions, it goes on and on and on. And the real art of design is figuring out how to solve those problems elegantly and inexpensively. So I hope you learned something. Please like my channel and help me grow. Subscribe, make comments. Um, I'm also going to put links in the description so you can download the schematics if you want to build one of these things. And also a link to um, the Borns TBU thing if you want to learn a little bit more about those. They're pretty cool. Thank you very much.